You are listening to The Cycling Podcast in association with Rafa, the fastest clothing in the world tour, the home of cycling with character. Ride and watch with Rafa in 2019 as they partner EF Education First and Canyon SRAM. Where are we, Lionel? We are outside the Muteria in London's King's Cross. I've noticed on the menu, the cocktail menu in Vermouteria, the Vermouth Bar, that there's a Milano Torino cocktail. Got vermouth in it and uh, various other ingredients. Might sure, it warm us nice. up because we've currently got blankets over our legs like old people. It's <laughs> like the old people we are. <laughs> well, <laughs> temperatures dipped a bit, hasn't oh, it, wow. in London the last couple of days? And how is it in uh, Berlin? Ciao, come stai, Daniele Friberencini. <laughs> That's not too bad, actually. Um, yeah, it's, it's a bit grey here today. The weather's been good recently, um, but yeah, it's quite grey in Berlin. Um, and a few issues with sleep at the moment, chaps. Um, you, you usually, usually, you know we're recording. You guys, yeah? are, you guys have frequently complained about insomnia in oh. the past, not on the podcast, but mm. privately. Mm. Um, I've thanks, been trying. For that. Now we've been outed. <laughs> I've been experimenting with intermittent fasting, and I don't know whether that's the reason why I'm not sleeping at all. Anyway, Int- not sleeping at all. Not really. No, hour or two a night. I've been listening to podcasts while. Um, Try and get me to the sleep. cycling it's podcast. Not no, not the cycling going back through podcast. the back catalogue. <laughs> no, no. But apart from that, I'm okay. No, it was, you wouldn't fall asleep to that, would you? It's too too entertaining. Um, anyway, uh, w- well, Lionel, we've come to our pause. We've been travelling a lot, haven't we? The last week, we certainly have. Week one of our grand tour took us from Bristol to Belfast, and then who's in the jersey? Uh, sparkly, sparkly leggings. Wow, actually. that's it. Yeah, um, the leaders' sparkly leggings were worn by Orla in Belfast on Friday night. Very memorable show. Great audience. Some great questions. Um, really, well, very close to a full house. I think it pretty much was a full house, wasn't it, at the Mac in Belfast? A uh, great way to end uh, a really good week of uh, live events. Thank you, everyone who came to see us. Um, really appreciate how many people turned up everywhere um, and then a couple of week, couple of days off at the weekend and then we were back in action on Monday night at the Arts Theatre weren't we Richard where we had Matt White Mitchell and Scott sports director came over extremely entertaining uh, a few comments that we probably couldn't broadcast well we'll have to probably leave out a few weeks before we broadcast uh, some of them <laughs> um, but we will uh, we'll hear from Matt White later on in this episode actually I sat down with him earlier in the day to talk about how they plan the season something I, th- I know you've always been interested in Lionel how, how that is actually done uh, when you've got a roster of 29 or so riders and hun- I don't know hun- how many race days 230 or something ridiculous uh, a, a, a big puzzle so we'll hear from him on that later on in the episode and Daniel you are preparing to join us for week two which kicks off on Monday at the Arts Theatre where we will be joined also by Adam Blythe and Rod Ellingworth who's obviously just uh, taken over at Barry Merida Uh, then we go to Cambridge Edinburgh Leicester and Manchester all next week we'll be joined in Manchester again by Adam Blythe and Chiro Scognamilio on that some big old yeah, transfers big transfers. Mm. Yeah, Chiro mm. Scognamilio is joining us in mon- on Monday as well. A very few tickets left for Monday at the Arts Theatre and for Edinburgh at the Churchill Theatre. There's about 10 left in Edinburgh, so it's almost sold out. Um, but go to thecyclingpodcast.com to get tickets to all these events. Pre-order our book as well while you're there. Looking yeah, forward well, to it, Daniel? Yes, very much looking forward to travelling on the, the team bus, Rich. Uh, very much looking forward to seeing whether you've prepared my rider. Um, that, that I, I sent through a few weeks ago. You know the missed that the open qualifying standard golf course that um, you were supposed to arrange <laughs> a round for me at in um, in Scotland. Should be great. Yeah, um, we're travelling by train actually, but uh, it'll be good. I'm looking forward to it immensely. Um, it's been great fun so far, um, and this week I think at home to rest is much needed isn't it Lionel it's quite yeah, exhausting it's a, it's, a, it's a strange old rhythm isn't it being on the road the travelling in the daytime and then the kind of the nerves start bubbling up for me anyway in uh, mid afternoon and then or the adrenaline shot of being in front of an audience and um, then the, the, the late dinner and well a very 
truncated night's sleep a couple of times not least because in Dublin um, we were staying in a hotel called the Harcourt Hotel and if you're in Dublin you'll probably know that this is uh, famously in a street um, which is basically dominated by um, nightclubs the, the downstairs of our hotel was basically a nightclub until three in the morning and uh, well certainly my room and Orla's room were um, well it was very very noisy and uh, if you can't beat them join them Lionel well, no I mean it was, I was quite tired by then to uh, be honest. wonderful moment in Belfast at the end when somebody who was queuing to buy a book introduced himself to Orla as the assistant manager of the Harcourt Hotel <laughs> um, she had obviously been posting about that on Instagram and there was a moment there where she she was taken in by that uh, very very funny indeed um, but big thanks to Orla and Francois Tomaso for joining us last week and uh, Francois sang the Marseillaise every night so looking for similar from you next week Daniel I don't know what song you've got up your what sleeve but what anthem uh, would you like me to sing Italian I think okay Okay. Well, they'll be caused to sing Get the Italian practicing. anthem on Monday, won't they? With Chiro yep. making a cameo appearance. There's a appearing. promise. There's a promise. Let's hear a little montage from our live shows last week now, shall we, chaps? Uh, I think we've got recordings from Belfast, Worcester and Cardiff. You may not know this, uh, although I'm sure this has gone down in uh, cycling folklore here, but Richard Moore uh, rode the Tour of the North many times and, in fact, was King of the Mountains at the Tour of Ulster. In what year was that, Richard? 1996, I think. 96 or 97. There's a, there was a start of a clap there. there. We'll go with that. <laughs> Although we were, we were, you were checking out your pro. Can you imagine this? You were checking out your pro cycling stats on the train up from Dublin earlier, you asked and there's me. no, there's no record of it. Oh. Of all of his Palmares, <laughs> there is, there is um, no Grand Tours, no One Day Classics. Well, What's the third one? Didn't write any. And that's very true. Um, the one entry in pro cycling stats for Richard Muir is Commonwealth Games. DNF <laughs> did not finish quite uh, unfair I thought yeah but know. pro cycling science only started after I'd finished so <laughs> they're still you know I, I found actually Richard Moore in uh, Cid du Cyclisme which is a Dutch site with lots of riders but it is, and there's a Richard Moore he's from Australia <laughs> and he won stuff so <laughs> but, but following on from the least deserved round of applause ever um, <laughs> this evening is all about Orla Shenoui very much your homecoming stage the one you've been targeting ever since the route was announced uh, earlier this year um, but I have to say I'm feeling very much at home here too because at lunchtime um, I, had, I had a very nice curry in our hotel restaurant and it came with uh, rice naan bread and chips the triple <laughs> whammy so uh, yeah this is the place for me um, this of course 1989 uh, Greg LeMond's um, uh, team jersey from the Tour de France Sean Kelly's jersey from his years at Cass of course uh, Robert Miller and uh, Greg LeMond wore the Z Peugeot, Peugeot jersey, very striking. I have no idea what this is. Um, somebody called R. Moore of Australia won the Tour of Space Ride one year. Lionel, where, 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 where's the US postal kit that you wore to write, to write, up, to write up Alp Duez on that occasion? I burnt it in the garden. As we wander around the team buses in Henley, someone remarks that today's stage includes the longest continual climb in the UK. Bull I say. A woman taps me briskly on the shoulder. I thought I recognised you. You're from the podcast, yes? Bugger, I've done it again. <laughs> I'm relieved when we get on the road. I have nothing against poshness per se, but it has always made me quite uncomfortable. As does the kind of countryside idyll that English people seem so fond of. Rolling hills, quaint stone buildings, perfect fences. There is something about supposed perfection of any kind that makes me deeply uneasy. As we sit down to a mid-stage refreshment stop in the most charming tea room you could imagine, Richard comes up with a theory. You're uncomfortable with posh, Orla, because you are posh. <laughs> Easy. <coughs> what? I'm not posh, sorry, Mum and Dad. I protest. <coughs> the actual posh ladies in the tea room bristle. I need to get out of here. If you really want me to sing... <laughs> I love how you change microphones and everything reluctant. Yeah, it, sh it, sh it changes everything, doesn't it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, so that if, if you listen to the podcast, you, you, you might have heard it, the, cru the lounge version of La Marseillaise, but it went something like that. Allons enfants de la patrie, un jour de gloire et 
est arrivé Contre nous de la tyrannie L'étendard sanglant est levé L'étendard sanglant est levé Entendez-vous dans nos campagnes Mugir ces féroces soldats Qui viennent jusque dans nos bras Égorger nos fils et nos compagnes Aux âmes citoyens Formez vos bataillons Marchons, marchons Qu'un sang impur abre nos sillons. <laughs> any, any news this week, Lionel? We've been scooped by a fellow podcaster this morning. Ned Bolting uh, has the, the news that Steve Cummings is retiring at the age of 38. Um, he was riding for Dimension Data, of course, this season. His last race was stage five of the Tour of Britain, which went from Birkenhead to Birkenhead. And being a, a, a lad from Merseyside, that was very much his home stage. And unfortunately, he crashed with 50 kilometres to go and, uh, well, ended up in hospital, had to have an operation, I think, and it, it fractured uh, vertebrae. Um, so, uh, uh, you know, a, a disappointing end to what has been a long and uh, at times very successful career. Who can forget the stage win that Cummings had at Mond in the Tour de France a few years ago when he completely outfoxed the French, didn't he, on the uh, run-in in the airfield there. And equally memorably, uh, the win at Lac de Payol the following year, 2016. And that was the day when the... Uh, kilometer to go banner was it was it the kilometer to go banner fell. it was one of the banners it was fell one of the big Yates, inflatable banners uh, collapsed onto adam yates um, but su- steve cummings had got through and um, won that stage he also won the tour of britain of course and he really made uh, a, 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 a his speciality was sitting towards the back of the peloton and um waiting for the opportunities and carefully selecting his opportunities to get in breaks um, but a very successful career he was both road and time trial national champion he rode the commonwealth games um, and i remember way back in 1999 the uh, 20 years ago this summer he won the eddie Sowens memorial um, handicap race at aintree up in liverpool and uh, well that's a handicap race and he's the, still the only junior to have won that event and later on that year he won the national junior road race championship somewhere in the midlands i was there that day um, and my two memories are of seeing uh, robert miller who was uh, one of the national coaches i think at the time uh, running up running up the hill to go and chat to steve cummings who just won the national title so yeah a long career comes to um comes to an end and, he, and ned has ned. The, has a scoop yeah he also featured in our how to retire episode uh, last year for friends of the podcast because he had started studying um, as well as uh, still riding his bike uh, with a view it, it, to what he was going to do after retiring. It, it's been interesting, chaps, to, to sort of observe from afar this the, the sort of process that he's gone through over the last um, couple of years. I've spoken to him a lot at races um, in the past two or three years. And um, from sort of the 2016 Dauphiné, when he was at the back end of this kind of purple patch where um, he was winning a stage basically of every world tour stage race that he was taking part part in um, very much in the same fashion um, in sort of long range breaks and, and ending up um, winning on his own to, to then which sort of um, then segued in 2017 which wasn't quite so good and then the last couple of years um, I've, you know, you've had a real sense that he was trying to figure out what his place still was if, if he did have a, a place still in the peloton there was quite a telling I suppose maybe poignant moment um, in the Tour de France this year in Po um, there was a time trial in Po and um, obviously you know Steve's own issues with with health and and form over the last couple of years um, the backdrop to that has been well the struggles of his team Dimension Data and this year um, there was a lot of uncertainty about whether he would or would not go to the Tour de France and and um, he was pretty much picked at the last minute and consequently hadn't really prepared in the way that he would have liked but one thing he had worked on was his or that he thought he could you know, kind of concentrate on was his time trialing and um, he expected I think to do quite a good ride that day and he came over the line and, and this often happens um, at the end of time trials uh, riders don't really know how well they've done and um, before uh, well I was going to interview Steve for ITV but I think before um, the camera sort of rolled he asked me how he'd done 
and I think the time gap from whoever was first um, at the time was about two and a half minutes and I told him this and I could see that he was sort of visibly taken aback and it was almost a, a, a kind of penny dropping um, in that in that split second um, and he sort of said to me well you know blimey I've, I, I'm not as good as I think I am anymore or I'm not as good as I, I thought I, uh, I was um, anymore and it was almost as though you know um, as I say in that moment and certainly over the course of the Tour de France he realised that um, his best was no longer quite as good as it had been um, a, a couple of years earlier and, and his decline had really started and was probably going to be inexorable from that point The fastest clothing in the world tour the home of cycling with character. Ride and watch with Ratha in 2019 as they partner EF Education First and Canyon SRAM. Thank you very much to our headline sponsor, Rafa. Very grateful to them, as ever, for their support of the cycling podcast. And um, the other big news, I mean, as you said, Lionel, not, not an awful lot of news in the last week. Another retirement, Daniele Benatti, the movie star veteran sprinter, is retiring. Um, we he don't know started yet. 25 Grand Tours, Benatti. 25 Grand Tours. Finishing 16 of them. That's quite... Um, and he's won a stage in each, the Giro, the Tour and the Vuelta. 25 Grand Tours, that, that's yeah. quite a, quite a very quite a career. Number. Very effective at, at reinventing himself, wasn't he, Benatti? He was, he was sort of the Kylie Minogue of the pro peloton. Um, he had <laughs> um, a few different he carnations. He should be so lucky. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, his um, locomotion initially was, was mainly... <laughs> Well, was mainly observed in sprint. Come on, Lionel, your turn. In sprint finishes, um, he was he was probably the most well, just about the most promising sprinter around when he started his career, uh, first couple of years. But then um, he became much more of a, a sort of road captain in his latter years, and, and he was also a lead out man at various times, a breakaway specialist. Kylie, I mean, I, I Kylie's thought. first number one was I should be so lucky. Um, <laughs> Benati Benati didn't finish any of his first four Grand Tours, so. Um, not sure. Not sure your analogy works, Daniel. Well, I'm yeah. that, it was especially for you that analogy. So, oh, I anyway. thought he and Movistar would be together forever. Um, oh but anyway, this is terrible. Oh um, uh, Bernie Eisel. I mean, the cu- couple of other writers from Dimension Data. Steve Cummings has retired. Bernie Eisel. Um, don't know yet. I think he is looking for another team, but currently without a team and maybe forced into retirement. Uh, Enrico Gasparotto, the veteran uh, Italian. Well, he's now Swiss. He's lived in Switzerland for a while and he will be able or eligible to compete for Switzerland next year at the Olympic Games and World Championships. Bernie Eisel, any news on him, uh, Daniel? Um, no, actually, Rich. Um, I knew for a while before Mark Cavendish's signing with uh, Bahrain Marina was announced that he, he wasn't going with Cavendish to Bahrain Marina. Um, I n- know that he wanted to do another season at least. Um, as a pro rider, but no news on that front at the moment. I mean, the other the other news that's still rumbling on is the ongoing tribunal into Dr. Richard Freeman. We talked about that in last week's episode, and we were recording last week after Shane Sutton's uh, evidence. Unfortunately, he didn't didn't quite last a day. He was supposed to be two days up in front of the tribunal. Shane Sutton um, stormed out, so don't, we didn't get. Well, the Mary O'Rourke, the QC to Richard Freeman, didn't get to put all her questions to him, which is perhaps unfortunate. Since then, we've had Phil Burt, the physiotherapist, who was the, the, the man. I mean, the, the, the hearing into Richard Freeman, it concerns a lot of, of charges against him. Um, I think 19 of the 22 charges have already been admitted by him, um, but he's contesting a few of them. And one in particular, which concerns us and cycling fans most of all, um, relates to the delivery of Testo Gel back in 2011, a uh, banned substance, obviously. A uh, £50 order from Fit for Sport, the regular nutritional supplier to British Cycling, arrived at Velodrome. It was intercepted by Phil Burt, the physiotherapist who, on discovering it, took it to Steve Peters, the head of medicine, who happened to be with Richard Freeman at the time. And uh, you know, Phil Burt apparently reacted with horror to this, and uh, I understand his first his first thought on opening it was, we're being set up here, I believe. And uh, he reported to Steve Peters. Steve Peters told... Uh, Richard Freeman said it had been delivered in error, um, and Peters told him to send it back. Now... Uh, it, it turned out. Well, it turns out now that it hadn't been delivered in error. I, we, we still 
we're no further forward. I mean, we expect to hear from Freeman. I understand Freeman will be appearing at the tribunal this week. Um, he was unable to appear last week, but he apparently will appear this week. Um, the number of scenarios are possible. That it was for Sutton, as Richard Freeman claims, that it was for Freeman, as Steve Peters suggested, or that it was for a rider, as the GMC maintain. And each of these scenarios is possible. We don't know which one is true. The key thing is, if it was for a rider, then it's a, a doping offence. I think the, the thing that struck me most from last week's uh, hearings, other than uh, sort of the explosive and, uh, I mean, almost almost pantomime cartoonish um, uh, appearance by Shane Sutton and of course we're going on, on just the, the written um, accounts and of course we had Tom Carey as well uh, on last week's podcast he was at the hearing just painting a picture for us um, I mean it sounds explosive and extraordinary uh, but the thing once the, once the dust had settled was once again Richard Freeman is uh, was, was too unwell to appear and take uh, take questions um, the other thing was Steve Peters, Dr. Steve Peters, the head of medical at British Cycling during this period, basically saying that he was he he felt like he was trying to solve a, a, a you know a case in which the two principal witnesses, Dr. Freeman and Shane Sutton, are both uh, at best unreliable and at worst lying. And um, you know that really struck me because when did that when did that kind of occur to? Dr. Steve Peters, that, that those were the kinds of people that were working in the organisation that he that he was working in. I mean, it, it, there's so, you know, each each strand of this seems to suggest further questions. And uh, as I said in last week's podcast, and and possibly didn't explain what I was meaning quite well enough when I said that um, it felt like a missed opportunity. I wasn't having a. I wasn't criticising Mary O'Rourke, um, um, Dr. Freeman's QC, because her job is very different um, to you know. She she's trying to do a job that's very different to um, just finding out exactly what happened. She's trying to defend Dr. Freeman and, and get the best pot- possible outcome for her client. Um, where, whereas as an observer from the outside, um, it would be great to think that somebody at some point is going to. Um, lay out all of the evidence and put all of the evidence to test and whether that will happen in this tribunal I don't know but the other question is whether UK anti-doping will pick this up after the conclusion of the tribunal if we don't um, if we don't get to the bottom of things so it's still as far as I can see as clear as mud really yeah and it's really about the 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 charge sheet against British Cycling and Team Sky over the sort of history of their Success and how much is added to that charge sheet. Um, already, I think there's the strong evidence which has been augmented during this case that the recruitment at Team Sky and, and to a certain extent British Cycling was was sloppy and didn't live up to the promises that um, sort of came with the sales pitch of this team that and all this all these organisations that showed incredible attention to detail. We know that because of. Um, well, the various riders who, or sorry, the various directors, sportives and staff that had to be let go um, by Team Sky when they did have a clear out, when they had this sort of, well, it wasn't really a, 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 an amnesty, was it a sort of um, a truth and reconciliation um, process because, you know, the, the, the individuals lost their job, the likes of uh, Stephen de Jong and Bobby Julik, who, had, who admitted that they'd used doping products during their career and they were subsequently um, let go so um, you know then you add in the likes of Geert Landers the the Belgian doctor who we as we know was also a, a Team Sky in 2011 um, you know the, the sort of sloppiness of the recruitment and you know you would have to question now whether Richard Freeman should have been in a job there and um, Shane Sutton certainly um, based on some of the stories we're hearing about him although you know I would also um, stress and, and as we've emphasised before on the podcast um, that the, there are those and there are many athletes who have worked with Shane Sutton in the past who would say that for all his um, vices and for all that um, his techniques probably didn't belong in a sort of 21st century um, co- coaching setup um, he was very talented at getting the best out of athletes um, in in the right circumstances, in certain circumstances, so you know, that that's one issue. But the, the, I suppose the thing that's really 
struck me watching it from afar, chaps, um, is, is how much emotion people have invested in this case going a certain way. Um, I think, you know, we all have to be honest with ourselves and everyone does have to be honest with themselves and ask themselves, you know, are there temporary conclusion, provisional conclusions being colored by what they hope um, is the final outcome of this? And, and I do think a lot of people um, want to see the whole British cycling team sky story edifice um, crumble and that's leading to some hasty conclusions um you know in, in the in the interest of complete transparency um what do i think about the whole organization and and the whole story at this point in time well my intuition is kind of changeable about it it's, it's amorphous um uh, at this moment in time i think you know there were aspects of it that were sloppy um i think that there was a line they had a line that they didn't want to go over um as far as doping as far as medicine was concerned but that line was maybe not in the place where members of the public thought that that line was or um in the place where maybe dave brailsford had suggested it would be um so you know they were they were going to stay within the law but it was going to be their interpretation of the law however um my intuition is still that um we don't have enough e evidence um to suggest that there was some wide-ranging doping program or even that um there was any kind of um doping program in the sense of you know using testosterone to enhance for example uh, a team leader's performance in the in the tour de france but you know that as i said that's very much a provisional conclusion and i think it's you know from our point of view it's important to be right not to be not to be the first or not to not to be quick um uh, to, to to make judgments about this we, you know we have to be patient and i think unfortunately everyone else has to be patient as well these the facts kind of um reveal themselves you know as more information becomes available and as this case in particular um goes on i just wince slightly when uh, you know i see people make the leap from okay this all looks a little bit um a little bit amateurish and you know there are obviously um disagreements and obviously politics to it's all a facade and marginal gains what we you know the, the term that we journalists have actually used probably more than the the actors than themselves the the dave brailsfords and so on that that's all complete rubbish and um and bunkum you know i saw a, a blog um or a, an article written by um someone whose opinion i actually um very much respect steve magnus the athletics coach who worked um with alberto salazar um and sort of became a whistleblower um in athletics but you know he's not a, a cycling specialist and and he wrote a a pretty measured piece uh, in the last well last week i think um sort of suggesting that um, maybe the uh, marginal gains and what had been talked about as marginal gains were kind of emperor's new clothes. Um, but, y you know, we've had hundreds of conversations with people over the last 10 years, over the lifespan of um, Team Sky, who have no real reason um, to, to extol the virtues of um you know the technology the know-how the savoir welfare um that they have been using but have have done so and continue to do so and um you know that doesn't mean that if someone mentioned the fact they drink pineapple juice in the interview that doesn't mean that that is a game changer but for example the fact that they there were times when they spent 10 more days at altitude um than than other teams in a season that might have changed um, the outcome of, of races and you know of a hundred things that they maybe try to do try to do differently uh, from other teams maybe only 15 did have an effect but there was also a, a big placebo effect and um, you know and I also think that over the past two or three years we've seen teams catch up and it's got and it's got harder for teams guy to to or what's now in us to employ and and and, and gain an advantage from from those minor details that maybe did bring them advantages in the first few years. But at the heart of this, as Richard said from the beginning, is it really this is a story of a breakdown in, in, in relationships, a falling out. And I, I think back over the 20 years I've been covering the sport, 
um, and, and think there's a sense of inevitability with that when Shane Sutton is concerned. Now, you know, uh, it's, it's easy to sound wise after the event, but I mean, I've never worked in elite sport. I don't, I don't know firsthand the, the kind of environments, um, you know, the, kind, the level of sacrifices required, the, the, the sort of the, the abrasive, um, you know, sometimes love-hate relationships. But I can kind of imagine, you know, just from you know, the, the, the way that uh, another sport that I follow, football, works, you know, managers who, well, Sir Alex Ferguson, one of the best in the business, uh, you know, kicking a boot across a room and uh, across a dressing room so it hits David Beckham above the eye or, you know, to give the hairdryer treatment. These things are, um, they're almost glamorised, glorified as being part of the, um, part of the, uh, the, the, the operating manual for, people who want to uh, drive sports people to greater um, performances and I think Shane Sutton um, is was an abrasive character he's someone who um, you know his 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 bite can be as bad as his bark sometimes I always had the feeling that he would have favorites um, you know there are athletes who have spoken very highly uh, of the, the the way that uh, Sutton has worked with them over the years in the certainly in the British Cycling Olympic um, program but there are also people you know one or two people I know who, who who barely want to mention his name in in regard to their own achievements and and who suffered through um, for the sakes of their own careers um, despite Shane Sutton not because of Shane Sutton and I think that the the thing that puzzles me I suppose is um, you know, the, 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 the fact that both in Team Sky and in British Cycling, uh, Sutton's methods, good, bad, indifferent, were tolerated because for a period they got results. And I think that that's the kind of the uncomfortable truth when we get to the end of, of all of this is that a culture was allowed um, to operate because it was successful and um, well we've seen there can be very little coincidence surely that as soon as Shane Sutton was sacked for effectively misconduct you know that things the, the, the how the card started to tumble but what, a, what a lot of people said about British Cycling somebody I, I spoke to yesterday um, quite you know involved in the in the staff there um, said that when Dave Brailsford and Steve, and Steve Peters were there at British Cycling Shane was I quote manageable Mm. And it was really when those two left that things unraveled very spectacularly. When Shane became the man in charge with nobody managing him, keeping him on a leash, um, things did unravel. And we saw how that unraveled. And, and you know, he, he was sacked for bullying, in, in effect, mm. and for sexism and all the rest of it. That, that's what he lost his job over. So that's not a revelation. That's not, you know, that no. wasn't something we learned last week in the tribunal. We, we knew that already. We did, but it, while it was getting results and no one was speaking out, it was all it was all in inverted commas fine, wasn't it? And I think that's the that's the bit that will when all of this is is digested, um, that's the bit that might sit least comfortably with with a lot of people. We but have I to that, that scale, that one to ten scale, it doesn't exist in reality. People are not at either ends of that scale. I mean, even Shane Sutton. No, of course not. And also, you know, harsh, being spoken to harshly. Um, some people react differently. You know, some people don't don't particularly mind. Some people it's, it works um, and it spurs them on. And some people, you know, don't don't enjoy that. And I think that the, the problem is that if you have a, a kind of one size fits all culture, um, well, you know, Shane Sutton's way or the highway uh, probably wasn't sustainable. Shoot, uh, shoot at l'arrière du peloton, cycling podcast, team car, the back of the pack, please. That's Seb PK, the voice of Radio Tour at the Tour de France, to remind us to tell you that this episode is sponsored by Harry's. And you can get started shaving with Harry's today by claiming your trial set for £3.95. Um, it's an appealing company to me, Harry's, even though I don't actually use their product. You I'm say that, scruffy. Lionel, but you were clean shaven quite recently. Um, experimented. Not quite, not quite, sort of stubbly stubbly but um, not quite egg like not quite, not quite egg like no thanks Richard <laughs> um, Jeff and Andy two ordinary guys who are fed up with the price of razors 
They started Harry's and uh, they knew that the only way they could ensure the quality they wanted was to buy their own factory. So their business model is based on just taking a bit less profit for themselves, uh, but still offering high quality razors for a fair price. And well, you can test out the Harry's trial set and judge for yourself with the weighted ergonomic handle, five precision engineered blades with a lubricating strip, rich lathering shave gel and the travel blade cover. Richard, you were smooth and lower half of your face with egg-like. Yeah, well, I'm, I've been using them ever since they began uh, our, their association with the Cycling Podcast. So, very happy customer. And if you do want to take that next step, Lionel, having experimented with the stubbly look, um, I can recommend them. So, uh, um, well, maybe I will. Maybe I will. Do it. Um, do it for our shows next week. Um, oh, I'd feel a bit naked on stage on. if I was completely egg-like. Um, anyway, uh, support the podcast and get your trial set delivered to you. You'll get the razor handle, the five blade cartridge, foaming shave gel and travel blade cover and go to harrys.com forward slash cycling. That's harrys.com forward slash cycling. Go there right now and you can get your trial set for just £3.95. Well, just before we hear from Matt White, who joined us on stage at the Arts Theatre earlier this week, um, got a couple of other things coming up uh, the November episode of the Cycling Podcast Femina is out later this week uh, that includes an interview with Cecilia Utrecht Ludwig and also a kind of retrospective feature on the Bulls Dolmans team the two sponsors are pulling out and the team's future is a little bit uncertain and they have been the best team in the world, probably the, be- the, the greatest ever uh, women's cycling team. Um, so uh, we look back on, on the team's history to date with some former riders, current rider, that's Chrissy Majerus, and the team boss, Danny Stam. And that's interesting, I think. Uh, so that's myself, Rose Manley, and Orla Shenoui with the Cycling Podcast Femina. Next week will be the latest episode of Service Course by the Cycling Podcast with Tom Wally and Lizzie Banks. And Rich, in yes. that... Um, in that feature on Bowles Dolmans, you mentioned the fact that from January 1st, I read this yesterday, um, the speed limit on Dutch motorways is going to be 100 kilometres an hour. Did you mention that? Didn't mention that, no. Is that relevant? Well, no, not really. Well, yeah, th- there is there's a tenuous link, you know, um, <laughs> the Netherlands. Um, it is a Dutch in, team, I'll give you that. Stuff. I felt I had to mention that. I was so taken aback. Um, by that, that I, I thought I'd save it for this week's podcast and, you know, sort of gauge your reaction to it. And the, the most extraordinary thing about it is that um, uh, public officials in, in the Netherlands have, have been quoted as saying they're well aware that there'll probably be more accidents because people will be bored and they'll be on their phones. Oh, it's dear, stuff. Dear. What? Is that What's that in miles, though, Daniel? That's the uh, important 60 thing. miles an hour. I'm joking, oh, of course I know. Oh, um, it is, well, um, the Netherlands is a country we admire for its cycling culture. And actually, one of the interesting things in that little feature on Bulls Dome is Lucy Martin wrote, only rode for the team for a year, but she was very interesting on the kind of Dutch culture uh, and it, around cycling and around women's cycling in particular and uh, from what she says it's no accident or coincidence that um, Dutch women riders have consistently been the best in the world um, because it sounds I mean it sort of links to the discussion we're having just before the break about British cycling it sounds like a very very harsh and performance oriented uh, culture um, and uh, it, 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 it sort of took her by surprise but she also feels that she gained from it personally but again it might not work for everybody um, so we're here, going to hear from Matt White now uh, sports director at Mitchell and Scott of course and I sat down with him uh, the other day just to ask him about the, the process of planning the season how do you allocate riders to races partly this was inspired by uh, I got a, I, I shared a car with him at the Tour of Lombardy where he was talking to his fellow sports directors about races that were coming up and how they were going to fill the roster because they had riders who were um, injured or who'd finished their seasons already and it, it seemed like a very complicated sort of jigsaw puzzle and um, so I was keen to know how they plan the whole season from I suppose the winter onwards here's what he said so Matt we're in the the off season um, I imagine one of the big tasks for you is planning for next year how, how does that process start you've got 28 29 riders I don't know how many you've got for next year how on earth do you begin to allocate them to races yeah I think it all, it all starts I, I build a calendar oh, it's getting earlier every year uh, this year I built it before before the Tour de France well before the Tour de France 
uh, for next year. Just you know, you've got a pretty good idea of who's staying, who's going, and then you, then it helps me to look for the the guys we're, we're going to buy for the year after. And then you're looking for the for the gaps in the calendar where you, where you need some reinforcements. Then once you've got that final the final couple of guys signed and now and look these days, I think we've the last couple of years we've all been done by before the tour started. I think I can't remember who was the last one who signed this year. Probably Andre Zeitz, and I'm pretty sure he was done pre-Tour de France. So back back in the day, people used to start signing at the tour, but that, I think those days are long gone. Um, okay, so there you've got you've got your roster, you've got your calendar, and then because I have been doing this role for few, well every year in this team, I've got a good idea of what what the guys are capable of doing, and then you know you've, you have discussions with with your sponsor or your, your general manager or. Your, and you, you can nut out what the focuses are for the team, and then you build a calendar around that. And I obviously start with the, our key guys, having discussions with those guys already mid-season, towards the end of the season last year. Yeah, you, know, you wait. Sometimes you wait for the route of the tour and the Giro to come into play. But yeah, I mean, we, we, you go after something. I think you go after it. I think the course, the course is the course, and you, you've got to adapt to that. But everyone, every team's different. And then yeah, start start planning away, and then you've got to fill the gaps there with uh, all the races that are non-world tour, the, the Spanish races and smaller races. You've got to, you know, usually you've got a relationship with the organizer there, write to the organizer, or they've written to you and ask and confirm your participation. A couple of the Spanish races chase a little bit of owed money from the years prior, <laughs> and, th- and basically threatened we're not coming back until you pay us 2018 and 19. <laughs> uh, uh, participation fee uh, and then you're away and then what I do is I'll, I'll build a calendar and then I'll send that to the coaches get some feedback from the coaches and it, look it doesn't always fit perfectly as well you've, you've got to you've got to make some adjustments we have our we had our camp in October the week of Lombardy and, uh, and you know where we sit down with each of the riders and ask them what they'd like to chase next year usually I can pick it pretty good. There was a couple of guys this year that went for a grand tour that I didn't expect, which means I had to adjust my planning. And strangely enough, you know, one key guy who changed, who wants a little bit of a different race program, that affects a lot of other people because you're booting people out from. You have to prioritise, and uh, you know, one little change does make a difference. And that's that's when you've got the, then you've got the calendar set. That's before the season starts, and obviously, once the season starts, it's a it's a jigsaw puzzle, mixing and matching with injuries, illnesses, and whatever may change your schedule. I, I, I imagine a jigsaw puzzle where the pieces are kind of constantly moving around. Um, and how, to what extent, are right the riders? I mean, I'm, I'm imagining that there are certain riders on the team who you, you are able to tell you these are the races I want to do. How far down does that go in terms of? You know the the caliber of the rider. To, to at what point does a rider have to fit into your schedule rather than the other way around? Or do you give each rider the opportunity to maybe say, "I'd like to do a certain race," or, or is it more fluid than that? Yeah, look, it is. It's really individual based. And look, even the our big guys, our big guys, they might want a race calendar. But if if we think as a team, it's actually you know, there's there's negotiation as well. You know. And there's not too many times where you're going directly against what, what some of the riders want. Some guys, strangely, want different ca- different calendars. Maybe not the Tour de France, or maybe not the Giro. Um, and with the young guys, yeah, look, honestly, you don't give them much choice because you know we're paid to manage their career, especially the early years. You know, and especially with the young guys, you might have an idea of what they're capable of. And I'm very cautious in the in the first year or two until you get to know a rider. I'll give them a pretty light program, and I'll only chalk the program a bit harder if I can see they're handling it mid-season so all the, all our guys I'm in the, in the midst now of writing to all our guys and giving them a calendar up until July and then I'll go and then I meet with all the riders either in Switzerland Dolphine or Slovenia again and then give them because by the middle of the year we've locked our Tour de France team in we've got a much better idea for our Vuelta team and then for the young guys I understand okay just keep them on a light program or some guys might be improving at a, at a rate of knots uh, the eights is when they came through, and and they need to be moved onto a harder program for the second half of the season. And what I mean, how do you do this? What do you use Excel? You know, what, do you have a, a document on your computer that you're always always tinkering with, and is that shared with other sports directors and general managers as well? Yeah, definitely. Look, I've got a live document um, which only I can edit, but hmm. 
which is good <laughs> because it is, it is a pretty complicated. You know, it's 240 race days with 28 athletes. Uh, we have one for the one for the riders, and then we have obviously other ones for staff and and vehicle movements, which is a crazy one. Fleet of vehicles we're moving around, but that people who have access to my calendar, I have the other six sport directors, the general manager, media team, uh, and the head swanure, the head mechanic, as well. So the doctors haven't got access. The, the doctors don't need that. They need. To, they want to know something to ask me. And do you enjoy that? I mean, is it a process that you quite like? I really do. I, I do. Uh, it's. I spend a lot of time on the calendar, and what I do is I also put notes into those races of what we're chasing. So, so it's clear for the, when the directors go to that race, they can go back and look at their the individual rider plans and the team plans. So we, we've got a clear goal of when you're building it. When with I, I build the teams, and then the other sports directors go and take over from there and. And chase those goals or targets we've set for that race. And I mentioned, I heard, obviously, it, it maybe gets more complicated towards the end of the year when guys are tired or injured um, or, or out for other reasons. They've maybe ended their season early. And I think towards the end of this year, you sort, you sort of, I think every team is limping towards the end of the season, aren't they? And that sounded very complicated. You were having a conversation with the other sports directors about how you would even fill the roster for some races. Yeah, we, we were travelling pretty good all year. And uh, look, in our team, our guys race less than any World Tour team because of our sponsors. You know, you know French teams have to do all the French races and and, Brit- and uh, Belgium teams have to do all the Belgian races. So the races we choose, they're really... You know, there's no pressure from Scott to us to, to race to, for races' sake. So my riders will... I think I looked at the end of last year, there isn't a rider in the top 100 riders' race days in my team. So I think the maximum this year was 75, and yeah, a lot of guys averaging in the 60s. And what we're seeing is more specific targeted training and less days of competition. But we had a bad run in the last week of the season. I think we lost three guys out with injury in the week pre-Lombardy, which then uh, put us in a bit of a hole for Guangxi and Japan Cup and Lombardy. And because I'd already had guys on holidays for three weeks, I'm not going to bring a guy... I wasn't going to bring a guy back into racing who'd already had two or three weeks off or, and guys were already on holidays in exotic locations. So we did very much limp our last through our last couple of weeks. But uh, I think most teams were in the same boat. And most teams used stagiaires and, to fill the gaps. And even with our stagiaires, we had three and um, they were all, it was all hands on deck for that last couple of weeks. Is that difficult from, for the team, I guess, for the guys left who are shouldering a, a bigger burn, but also with the race organizers and we're talking about ASO and, and people like that is that, is that are those tricky conversations that you have to have yeah look what I, I do the guys who start in January in Australia are starting at 100% so I deliberately shut those guys seasons down early so I, so no one no one who rides to it and under went past the world championships and a lot of those guys finished in Canada or even before so those guys were already on a month so nearly ready to get back on the bike so obviously if you're going to if we're going to be winning a world tour race in the second week of January, you, so you're not you're not racing in the middle of October. So the guys who who did have to fill the gaps, they're the guys who started a little bit later or had a big mid-season break or come off the welter and were still running with some form. So we manage, we manage. And you mentioned that you know next season's all, almost done. I mean, you started that document before the tour. Are you, are you find you're tinkering with it even at at the tour, or is your mind fully focused on the tour? Uh, it was fully focused on the tour because I knew we were, we were, we were pretty much luck. We had one spot we were we were knowing about what we were, we were going to keep. So yeah, it was, it was fully focused. But in between the Giro and the tour, it's a busy period. And I remember in the past I'd always do it after the tour, and because of the market is getting so early now, yeah. it was the last thing I really felt like doing <laughs> in between the Giro and the tour, and then popping into those three races and building a calendar and. It was just a necessity. Otherwise, you know, you miss the boat because the teams are getting in early and investing uh, in talent for the season after. I guess when I was thinking about this, I was thinking about guys like Mikel Nieve and Trenton's gone now. But but those guys who aren't perhaps out and out leaders, but they can win races. They're they're very talented. How do you uh, how do you manage them? How do you give them enough opportunities to keep them? 
sort of rewarded or, or, mm. or incentivized for those while also depending on them and, and the team rules that they do yeah I think it's all about relationships with those with those guys it's relationships with everyone if you don't give a young guy what he what he perceives as a, a calendar where he, he thinks he's getting the opportunities it's that it, either he will look or he'll get pushed from a manager to look look elsewhere so You've, the, the smallest and the youngest guys are just as important as the biggest guys and I think if we look at the amount of races we've won over the, the last seven years and this year was 35 but it was from 11 or 12 different people so we, we're not a team that is very you know, yeah we've got our leaders but I think the, the most wins this year was five or six from a per rider was, I think it was Adam Yates and Trentin had five wins each or, and then Darryl Impey but there was lots of guys who won races and you know, there's no one in this team who can put their hand up and say I didn't get a chance to go for a win. Now, if they didn't, they didn't go looking for it hard enough. And I think that's the reason why you know, we've got one change for next year. And uh, we haven't had too many changes in general. Is that something you're happy about? I mean, is that a sign of a settled team, a well-balanced team that you're happy with? Yeah, look, sometimes you've got to, you've got to freshen up the roster. And we've had to do that the last couple of years because we've, we've just had some older riders. So you, you know, at the end of the day, you've got to move them on. Uh, it's, it's it's great that someone like Michael Albacini can do eight years with his team and finish at 40 years of age and tour of Switzerland, but it doesn't work for everyone. And it, I think if you go a season or two long with some of those older guys, you've missed that next wave. And you've always got to be thinking, I'm thinking of getting results for next year, but I'm always thinking of what have we got in 2021? Or who's our next who's our next wave of GC guys, our next wave of classics guys? And it's a weird sport in the fact that there's not too many teams who have got sponsorship for more than two years, three years. So you, 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 everything you plan is all hypothetical that, you, that your team still exists in three years' time. And you, it's, a, it's, a, it's a weird way to work, but that's the model that cycling has unfortunately created and that's, you've got to work within those, uh, those boundaries. I mean, any news on the sponsorship front? I spoke to Jay Ryan about it at the, at the Giro and he said there'd been some meetings and so on. Well, at the same time, you know, he's always said that there's no threat to the team at all. That he's happy to, to carry on supporting it. But is there any news that you're aware of? Look, there's, there's some things in the pipeline, and, and and hopefully we can announce them for the start of next year. But as I said we've got a very very loyal owner, and I think what Jerry's looking for is he's looking he wants to be involved in the team. But what he would love is just for us to find a sponsor that that suits what we, we want to achieve and it's sustainable that, that we can have a sponsor for the next five to ten years and that, that he can take more of a back seat but you know, fortunately for us he's been an incredible incredible sponsor and since since we've lost Orica uh, him, him, he personally and uh, and Scott have really stepped up and enabled us to continue uh, without a, a major key sponsor besides Jerry and next year all about the Grand Tours again with the Yates brothers in particular yeah, definitely. I think definitely for the Giro on the Tour. We, you might see a surprise for the Walter, but uh, for the Giro on the Tour, I think we'll run a pretty similar, pretty similar template to 2019. The Cycling Podcast is supported by Science in Sport. Science in Sport. Fueled by science. Thank you very much to Science and Sport for their support of the Cycling Podcast. Very much appreciated. And the 25% offer is still available at scienceandsport.com with the code SISCP25. That's SISCP25 at scienceandsport.com. Looking forward to seeing some people from Science and Sport at our show at the Arts Theatre next Monday. Um, we heard from Matt White before the break there, um, chaps, and... I don't know what you... I mean, uh, so, some nuggets as ever when Matt White talks. He always um, he offers a lot of interesting insight. You know, the, the fact that his riders race fewer days than any other World Tour team, that they're not obviously tied to um, racing their home races uh, because they're an Australian-based team, was interesting, I thought. And, uh, yeah, that whole process of, of putting, you know, the spreadsheet together, I was surprised at how early he starts that you know before the Tour de France that he's tinkering with it all the time and that no one else can edit it apart from Matt White extraordinary stuff where it's very much like the um, cycling podcast drop box isn't it um, <laughs> which we're not allowed to edit only Buffalo's allowed in there oh well, no Buffalo has no, the password no. um, you're not allowed to delete anything that's, that's slightly different well actually actually Daniel what I, you did delete 
a load of files, didn't you, on one oh, occasion? I, did. I deleted a whole archive once. You night, did, yeah. And yeah. I had to. Sorry about that. I had to, thanks to Dropbox. <laughs> exactly. It kind of proves the point. My uh, apologies. Dro- Dropbox support managed to retrieve all my interviews with the um, Action Hagen Berman's team. I mean, it's a, it's a good um, system because you could imagine riders going in and just deleting, you know, their least favourite the, races, deleting the themselves from the roster. Four days of Dunkirk, yeah. Enco <laughs> Tour, they'd be popular ones. Yeah. Yeah, so um, to Matt, Matt White would be thinking he's got everything sorted, and then no one turns up at the four days of Dunkirk. <laughs> um, uh, Rich, as far as planning is concerned, and, and that team, what's really going to intrigue me, I think, next year is to see, and maybe you know, talking a bit more to Matt as well, and maybe a couple of the coaches at Mitchelton, is, is to see what sort of adjustments they will have made as far as the Yates brothers are concerned, because as I sort of playfully ribbed uh, Matt White about this at one of our events or I think um, our event at Harrogate actually um, at the World Championships the fact that over the last two years um, that, that unfortunately they've, they've kind of fallen short of their expectations um, as far as the general classification in major tours is concerned I think out in five out of six major tours um, with the Yates brothers so Simon Yates obviously won 2018 uh, Vuelta but um, he he lost the jersey spectacularly in the Giro in 2018. Adam Yates's Tour de France in 2018 didn't go too well. Simon Yates's 2019 Giro um, wasn't quite what he, he hoped and expected it was going to be. Same with Adam Yates's 2019 Tour de France, and um, well, and then the Vuelta they didn't really have a, a GC leader, so. Um, the, the, I, I'm sure they know um, there's some work to be done yeah, I, there I can, as far as sort of timing the, the form peaks is concerned yeah I can enlighten you a bit there because he told us on stage the other night actually that next year will look very similar to this year uh, Simon Yates will go to the, the Giro uh, and then also go to the Tour but probably not finish the Tour because the Olympic Road Race is a big target for him next year and again Adam Yates will, will lead the team at the Tour but I think that you know the following year there will be some changes and I think the following year we'll we'll see Simon Yates target the tour and Adam Yates might become more of a kind of one day and one week stage racer I suspect Um, I think that the, the, the differences between them are becoming more apparent as they sort of mature and in terms of temperament it looks like Simon you know has, has the ability but also the temperament for a three week tour um, and and Adam might you know become evolve into a slightly different type of rider but um, that seems to be the, the two year plan um, Giro again for Simon Yates next year Tour de France in 2021 in a similar vein, um, Astana, I think, have made some decisions over the last couple of weeks, haven't they, about who's going to lead them where in 2020. I think um, they've decided that Fulsang is going to be the leader at the Giro and uh, Superman is going to go to the Tour. For the first time, Miguel Angel Lopez. Is that right? That is right. Yep, his first Tour de France. So he hmm. can uh, flatter to deceive there as well. Oh. Having done so. <laughs> Sorry. He'll finish between third and ninth. Sorry, I didn't mean that. Well, it should it's be a good Tour cool. de France for him, of course, yep. with the um, with a very, very sparse time trialling mm. um, and the, the time trial on the penultimate day um, up to La Planche de Belfi. Finally, before we go, um, it was Raymond Poulidor's funeral this week. We talked about him with Francois last week, um, but you, you tweeted about him last week, Daniel. Just, uh, I suppose he seemed one of these... Not, not hardly ageless because he was an old man but he was sturdy and, and you know robust looking character wasn't he uh, and and even despite his advancing years I think it was quite a shock um, especially as we'd all seen him so recently at the Tour de France to hear that he'd passed away yeah he always looked in very good health at the Tour de France and didn't really you know there was no noticeable sort of evolution or there was no noticeable ageing really uh, um, over the last few years um he he sat every day in his little kind of booth in the tour de france start village and um was constantly being well he didn't see it as being pestered um he he loved the attention in fact um i think it was in l'equipe um a day or two after his death i think they published republished an interview they'd done with him in 2011 and he talked about um the fact that his biggest fear in life was to no longer be 
be recognized even sort of on a, on a micro level um, in the the 11 months of the year when he wasn't at the Tour de France he would sort of put his coat on and go out of um, go out of his front door every morning sort of hoping and praying that someone would recognize him and ask him for an for an autograph and um, I suppose you know that, that says a lot about his the, the sort of reciprocal relationship between him and the, and the French public um, they loved him and he loved he loved them. And um, fame for him seemed to have no downsides. You know, his great success in life was to be loved and admired. Um, rather, he didn't have the sort of fame that maybe comes with winning. Um, you know, I, I, you know, I think that, and, and he embraced that that sort of uh, status that he had, didn't he? As 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 a, somebody who was loved for not winning much. Shall we wrap things up there, chaps? We shall. Looking forward to next week. Mm. Uh, as I say, tickets still available at the cyclingpodcast.com. You can also go there to order our new book, The Grand Tour Diaries. Uh, click on book and you can get that delivered anywhere in the world. Just on uh, Monday's event at the Arts Theatre in Leicester Square. It's literally around the corner from Leicester Square Tube Station. Um, so very convenient if you are in central London on Monday. And if you came to our show this Monday, just gone, um, don't worry, we're not doing the same thing. We've got a different lineup. Daniel will be with us, of course, as will uh, Rod Ellingworth, new boss at Bahrain Merida or Bahrain McLaren, as they'll be, and Adam Blythe, of course, who made a six-part series, the Adam Blythe interviews for us at the start of the year. And and uh, well, there'll be and a, Chiro. a cameo from Chiro, of course. He'll be he'll be buzzing in and then buzzing off again, I guess. Yeah. Well, so it'll be different. So yeah, if you if you enjoyed Monday, um, come along again. Come back until Monday, Lionel. Thank you very much. Thank you, Richard. Thank you, Daniel. Thank you, chaps. Just finally, before we go this week, a little personal uh, message from me. Pancreatic Cancer UK are the official charity of the year partner for the Ride London 100. That's the Prudential Ride London 100 in 2020. Um, the the charity is close to my heart because my mother passed away with pancreatic cancer in 2005. It's a an awful disease, and I'm a proud supporter of Pancreatic Cancer UK. I will I will be riding Ride London uh, to raise money for pan, uh, Pancreatic Cancer UK next year. Uh, you can get a place in Ride London through Pancreatic Cancer. They have just 100 places remaining, and they're offering cycling podcast listeners who join me on the ride a 50% registration fee discount. That doesn't mean you have to ride with me. That'd be quite slow for a lot of people. Just and, use and you c- can ride the whole hundred. Um, the whole route of the, uh, the I'm going to ride the whole route yeah, not, you're not going to just do half of it are no, you? I'm going to do the whole route <laughs> just use the code MOORE50 M-O-O-R-E 50 uh, sign up at pancreaticcancer.org.uk forward slash ride London that's pancreaticcancer.org.uk forward slash ride London <laughs> <laughs>